Good morning, everyone. My name is Calvin Gladney. I'm president and CEO of Smart Growth America, and welcome to Smart Growth America's third and final day of our equity summit. There's been so many money quotes, microphone drop moments, and calls to action. You know what? We'll talk about that a little later. Right now, I'll hand this over to the host um, just to do a couple of administrative things, and you and I can talk about more what has happened and what's going to happen today. Welcome. Thank you, Calvin, and welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for the final day of the three-day virtual summit organized by Smart Growth America. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the manager of infrastructure and development at the Maryland Department of Planning and project manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse, a project of the National Smart Growth Network that includes the website smartgrowth.org where you can sign up to participate in webinars like these on a variety of smart growth and planning topics. I've been honored to have served as your host over the past few days as we've convened an exciting group of experts, practitioners, and policymakers to discuss how to center improving racial equity and smart growth work. This impressive lineup of speakers has been discussing how to promote equity in housing and land use, why strong black and brown businesses are key to neighborhood vitality, and how to right the wrongs of past damaging transportation decisions and to promote restorative justice. This series is being recorded and will be available online after the event at smartgrowthamerica.org. We also hope that you'll share your thoughts throughout the day on social media. You can tag us at smartgrowthusa and the hashtag for the day is hashtag smartgrowthequity. We'd love to hear what is resonating with you as each day unfolds. And as we've done on the previous days, we're going to begin with a poll that just shows where everybody is at. So you can see on the screen here, uh, you can answer the question, how would you rank your expertise or comfort in improving racial disparities through your work? And you can select one of these. I'm a novice. I'm not a, I know I'm not an expert. Been at this for a minute. I know what I'm doing and I could have been speaking today. And as in the past, if you're having any trouble with uh, responding to it, you may need to exit from full screen mode. And we'll uh, leave it open for a couple of minutes here. Well, not actually a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to give people a chance to respond. It looks like about a quarter have already. So thank you for participating. Once we close it, we'll share the results and, and continue on the program. Okay, so from this poll, 57% uh, know that they're not experts. 24% uh, have been at this for a minute. Seven or 11% are novices. 7% uh, know what they're doing and 1% could have been a speaker today. So we, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment or two to thank our presenting sponsors for their support in making this event possible. This three-day virtual summit was made possible by City. City's action for racial equity represents unprecedented effort to leverage City's core business capabilities and a City Foundation philanthropy to help address racial equity and justice in the U.S. Our gratitude also goes out to EPA's Office of Community Revitalization, Office of Environmental Justice, and the Conflict Pre Prevention and Resolution Center for their support. And lastly, the Maryland Department of Planning is not only a presenting sponsor, but has been providing immense technical support with running the summit each day this week. Finally, closed captioning for Smart Growth America's Equity Summit today was sponsored by AARP. AARP's Livable Communities Hub is a rich source of free resources for local leaders on how to make housing, transportation, and public spaces work better for people of all ages and abilities. Visit aarp.org forward slash livable to read more and to sign up for their newsletter. You can also sign up for AARP's Livable Communities newsletter directly from your phone by texting LIVABLE to 50757 to get regular updates on free resources and tools. And with that, we're going to move into another uh, poll question. Today, we'll soon be hearing about a policy proposal to remove divisive highways. We'll get to the details later, but is this a bad idea, a good idea, but unlikely or infeasible? or a great idea and wholly essential. Again, we'll give you a few seconds to respond. And a few people have. Again, you may need to uh, 
exit full screen mode to respond to this. I'll leave it open for a few more seconds if people are responding now. I can see them coming in. And the responses here today, 54% um, think it's a great idea and wholly essential. 40% think it's a good idea, but too unlikely or infeasible. And only 6% think, think it's a bad idea. So we're all excited about today's schedule. We'll be opening with Smart Growth America's CEO and President, Calvin Gladney, who started at the beginning, followed by remarks from the Director of Transportation for America, Beth Osborne. That's all before we jump into today's signature panel on the role of government in undoing the harm caused by the interstate highway system, led by Mary Skelton Roberts, who is the Senior Vice President for Programs at the Energy Foundation. And that's going to be followed by a Q&A. You can submit questions anytime during the session in the questions tab in the control panel on your screen, and the panel will answer a selection of them during the Q&A section after their discussion. Also, viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Smart Growth America's Equity Summit. You can also search for event number 9211441. All of the programs during the Equity Summit this week are available on the AICP CM portal on the APA website. So if you didn't get a chance to go there yesterday, um, they are now available for your use. Uh, we're going to hear from the following speakers to kick off the day. First, Calvin Gladney, who's President, CEO of Smart Growth America, and then Beth Osborne, Smart Growth America's Vice President of Transportation and Director of Transportation for America. After the opening speakers conclude, we'll shift into the, today's signature panel moderated by Mary Skelton Roberts, Senior Vice President for Programs at the Energy Foundation. In this newly created leadership role, she will guide the Energy Foundation's climate programs with a focus on the ongoing integration of equity. In her previous role, Mary serves, served as the co-director for climate at the Barr Foundation, where she focused on transportation and land use, two critical levers for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mary is going to be joined by a group of experts and practitioners, including Dr. Destiny Thomas, who is the founder and CEO of the Thrivance Group. Dr. Thomas is a change agent and an anthropologist planner. She is the founder and CEO of the Thrivance Group, where she works to begin to bring transformative justice into public policy, urban planning, and community development. Melvin Giles, who's a community leader and advocate in the Rondo neighborhood of St. Paul, Minnesota, will be with her. Melvin is a veteran peace, diversity, and dismantling racism educator and artist. He incorporates peace bubbles, peace messages, and in the international peace poll to create places and spaces of peace. He has extensive experience working with youth, academia, government agencies, nonprofit agencies, and neighborhood group, groups. And finally, they'll be joined by Minnesota State Representative Rena Moran, who is the chair of the Health and Human Services Policy Committee and co-chair of the Select Committee on Racial Justice for the Minnesota House of Representatives. Before we do that, we're gonna have one final poll here, and that is specifically what we all think is the biggest barrier to taking down highways. And here we have uh, four options, the high cost of removing a highway, cities require driving and highways are essential, displacement resulting from increased property values, and finally, fear of change. So we'll give you a few seconds to respond to that. And and thanks again for everybody who is um, participating in these. Uh, we are collecting all of the information about uh, your questions and responses to review afterward to determine some of the next steps after the summit is concluding. So all, all of your participation is very welcome and helpful, not only today, but into the future. Just give you a couple more seconds and then we'll be turning it over to Calvin.
Okay, so for this uh, poll, 52% think the biggest barrier is fear of change, 24% being the high cost of removing the highway, 18% uh, cities required driving and highways are essential, and finally only 6% displacement resulting from increased property values. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Calvin Gladney. Good morning, Calvin. Good morning again. Um, and just in case you didn't hear me before, uh, my name is Calvin Gladney. I'm president and CEO of Smart Growth America. And literally thousands of you have joined us over the last two days of our equity summit and wanted to quickly give you some little bit of a recap and focus on three main things that we've heard over the last couple of days um, and ones that I'm certain we'll hear today. So those three themes are one, you have to talk about race and racism. Secondly, the idea that equity is stimulus. And third, that equity is not enough. So first equity, um, talking about race and racism. One of the key things that came up was there is no way to center racial equity, get to economic inclusion, or achieve restorative justice without talking about the legacy of inequity, racism, and in some cases, specific anti-Blackness that flows from a lot of our transportation, land use, infrastructure, and economic development, development decisions. You actually had um, Council Member McDuffie on our panel yesterday put it this way. He said, look, we already know what the problem is. It is the history of discrimination and racism that manifested itself in the stark racial disparities we see today. We have to talk about those to actually create solutions that are viable and also take into account what happened in the past. So you have to talk about race. The second is our most retweeted, talked about quote of the last two days. Um, and it comes from our keynote speaker on Monday, Dr. Andre Perry. And no, he doesn't go by Dr. Dre, by the way. Um, Dr. Perry said, equity is stimulus. If you truly care about growing the economy, then you will care about improving equity. And embedded in that comment is the idea that in addition to moral arguments about why racial equity and closing racial disparities is important and is just the right thing to do. It is also the right thing to do for our economy, not just the country's economy, but the economy of our cities, our communities, our neighborhoods, and our individual economies as well. So equity is stimulus. As a matter of fact, um, Jasmine Thomas from City also picked up on this theme and said, not only is equity stimulus, but our fates are tied. This racial web wealth gap, it's killing all of us. It's killing us financially, it's killing us economically, and it's impacting what we can all do together. So equity is stimulus, and there's really no better way to unlock our economy as we talk about unlocking our economy going forward. There's no better way to get to all of the untapped potential in this country, particularly in black and brown communities. And there's no better way to reset, restart, and, and undo some of the devaluation, to use a term that Dr. Perry uses often, the devaluation of black and brown people, neighborhoods, and assets around the country, there's no better way to do that than to focus on equity. And finally, and just as importantly, although equity is stimulus and we have to talk about race and ra racism, equity alone is not enough. It's we, Equity alone is not enough because we can't just simply stop and no longer do or no longer use the policies of the past and hope that the harm that they created, the racial disparities that we now see, will all go away just because we stopped previous policies. We now have to go that next mile and say, it's beyond equity, it's beyond economic inclusion. We have to figure out what are the things that we can do to repair the damage, to create, as, as many will say, and you'll definitely hear on the panel today, restorative justice. Um, we heard from Sakita Kant on day, Grant on day one that equity in this work is about healing and it's essential to achieve this healing for the liberation of all humans and for our planet. And as a matter of fact, Chase Cantrell on the first day as well said, you know, we have to think about not just equity, 
but we also have to think about the money we're putting behind things. And frankly, as Chase said, our budgets are moral documents. Our budgets are moral documents. So it's, it's, it's really a focus not just on whether we're creating equitable policies, and Council Member McDuffie and panel yesterday talked about this as well, but also are we putting our money where our mouth is? To quote the great philosophers Wu-Tang Clan, as I like to do a lot, cash rules everything around me. So all of this work, all of the conversations and discussions we've had over the last two days um, is just the beginning. It's just the catalyst. It doesn't end today. We wanna do everything we can as Smart Growth America and as a Smart Growth Movement, working with all of you to make sure that all of our tools, all of our ideas, all of our best practices are shared so that we can get to moments of racial equity, get to economic inclusion, and get to restorative justice. And one of the ways we're gonna do that is to send things to you afterwards. We're gonna send recordings, but we're also gonna create discussion guides so you can do a book club, you can sit with your colleagues, you can have meetings where you say, hey, let's all watch some of these videos and there will be recordings together and think about what are the things we can go do. Because we want everything we learned today and talk about, or talked about over the last couple of days to really move us towards action. This is all about action as advocates, as technical assistant providers, as community members, as elected leaders, and as just people all around the country. So with that, let's get on to day three, because we're not done. Let me hand the reins over to my colleague and one of my favorite folks, Beth Osborne. She's gonna give a couple of remarks where we talk about how do we start this, this, this journey of restorative justice? How do we repair some of the issues and challenges that have happened because interstate highways have gone through black and brown communities over many decades. She's gonna start that conversation, give you some proposals and ideas that we're very excited about uh, on how to solve those and then lead you um, in the panel discussion later. Thank you. And thank you, Calvin. Uh, really happy to, to be presenting on this very important topic and, and inspired by how many people have turned out to hear about it and discuss it. Um, so uh, we are uh, here to talk about uh, a policy that we've been working on to undo the, the generational damage of urban renewal highways. Um, this is something that uh, we often think of as being uh, placed in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but it is actually a problem that is continuing into present day. So we're gonna start with what is urban renewal? So-called urban renewal initiatives of the 1950s and 60s, or that's when they began, ostensibly provided money to cities across the country to revitalize neighborhoods. But in practice, particularly the new interstates, raised housing and ripped through neighborhoods, displacing more than a million Americans during the first two decades of the federal interstate system. These projects often deliberately targeted communities of color and particularly black neighborhoods, wreaking havoc on their local economies, health and local environment for decades. When we first put out our proposal to go back and, and address this damage, Calvin shared the proposal uh, on Twitter and invited people to share uh, you know, on the, the Twitter feed examples from their own communities. This attracted over 300 responses with examples from all over the country, from communities large and small, showing how pervasive this issue actually is. We're gonna go into a handful of pictures to make real the damage that was done. So this is Atlanta in the 1950s before Interstate 75 and 85. And before I show the after picture, I really want you to focus on the, uh, the tree-lined community, the, the gridded and connected streets, and think about the vitality and activity and density of, of economic activity in this area. And now I'm gonna show you what we did. This picture says most of what I need to say, but I, I can never let my feelings go unverbalized. So 
just I'm so struck by the removal of all of not just the people, but all economic life. And this was done for supposedly for economic benefit. How many fewer residents are there? Putting aside the, the family and personal community devastation caused from a practical regional economic bottom line, how many acres of productive job creating and tax generating property has been lost all for a highway that costs a fortune to maintain? This highway was sold on the economic benefit and the time savings for those who wanted to travel through this area. What about all the time loss for those that are trying to get across this monstrosity? That isn't even counted because that's not what we have cared about. This is Detroit. Um, same question. Look at the picture on top. Look at the, the, the heavily uh, developed area. And, not just homes, but businesses, strong businesses in operation. And look at what we've got in its place. Again, it's a uh, uh, income generating, economically vibrant area replaced by infrastructure that sucks out cost and, and, and federal and state and local dollars to pay to maintain. And this just wasn't a, a, an accidental mistake we made, and it's not just in the past. Kansas City completed one of these highways through the Ivanhoe neighborhood just in 2002. And as much as we like to pretend uh, that, that may, maybe it was just 18 years ago that we, we finished up these mistakes, there are many projects on the books now to create new problems or exacerbate the problems that already exist. We're hearing a lot these days about how infrastructure is a priority for everyone. And we've heard a lot of talk about that in the past, though there does seem to be added focus these days. A priority, yes, but any infrastructure investment is not what we're after. Um, we want projects that will create, sustain, and develop strong communities that strengthen the communities that exist. The idea that any money isn't good money has not been the attitude. We need to look at the quality of what's being built and what it's doing, not just for the region, but for the community it touches. If we aren't strategic with the investment, we're going to get more problems. Uh, the very problems we're looking at fixing right now uh, will exacerbate racial inequities. There will be more pollution and, and environmental problems and more problems in terms of, uh, of public health. We must remember that because of our history, even simple questions like whether to repair or rebuild infrastructure at the end of its useful life becomes a discussion about racial equity. Many want to have this conversation without referring to our original sin because we weren't around for it. But continuing to maintain these highways that divide and hold back communities, particularly communities of color, is not a benign discussion. It is not a simple repair project. Continuing to value the convenience of people passing through over the opportunity and health of those on the ground continues the history of racism, whether those of us working now are part of the earlier decisions or not. So what we're gonna focus on today is how to repair past damage. But we also need to recognize, like I said before, that there's going to be future damage if there isn't major reform to the existing program. And we should also acknowledge that it doesn't take a limited access highway to create divisions and harm neighborhoods. Even the way we build some of our arterial roadways, uh, our big important main streets, have caused a lot of damage and division. So moving on to the proposal, I want to just start by saying that I view this through the lens of my hometown, New Orleans, and the Claiborne Expressway which is a highway that divides a neighborhood called Treme, made more famous by an HBO series that has brought uh, the vibrance and, and beauty of this community to the attention of people who didn't grow up in New Orleans. Um, when I was at the US Department of Transportation, we provided funds to New Orleans to consider taking down the Claiborne Expressway, and they found several barriers. One is cost, though repairing and replacing uh, the Claiborne Expressway, which has reached the end of its useful life, is very expensive as well. 
The other uh, two problems were that the models we use to determine what will happen to traffic in the area caused by a takedown are not up to the task. They cannot tell that people might not take a trip uh, like they did before, or they might shift a trip to a different time, or they might choose a different corridor. The models we have developed, which are only as good as the, the, the way they're programmed, assume that everyone will travel in exactly the same way they always have, even when the whole area has been transformed. And it must uh, believe that every trip will occur mm -hmm. and that it will stay in the corridor, which means that if it can't go on the newly constructed boulevard that was being considered on Claiborne Avenue, that it will flood local streets. So basically, what they are saying, what the model says, is if you can no longer go 55 miles per hour on a, a separated highway, you will choose instead to go 15 miles per hour down local roads that are not well connected and are not terribly well maintained. It's illogical, but that's what they say, and they create fear of what's going to happen to the neighborhood because they tell falsehoods. The last issue that was raised is that local residents were afraid that they would be harmed by price pressures caused by removing the thing that destroyed their property values. So I wanted to develop a proposal to address all of these challenges. And I worked with my colleagues at Third Way to put together a proposal that would create a competitive grant program to redesign or deconstruct outdated infrastructure like these highways. But they would be coupled with a land trust and new modeling and guidance that could help people deal with the other challenges uh, to, to taking on these projects. So the competitive grant program would be a $10 billion program that uh, communities would propose uh, and show how that money, uh, the portion of funding that they got would result in uh, a completed project to change the infrastructure. But as part of it, they would have to uh, work with, uh, or they would have to propose and uh, establish and um, seek funding also through this program for land trusts, land trusts that would help the locals buy uh, their property, uh, as well as preserve and build affordable housing in the region so that those who were originally harmed by the infrastructure get to benefit from its removal. Um, the land trust would also be focused on supporting locally owned small businesses uh, that exist, but also helping new ones open and preserving green spaces and parks. It would also instruct USDOT to put out new modeling tools that are capable of considering what we've seen on the ground when other highways have come down. We've discovered that many trips just disappear or they shift to other times of day or people find other ways to travel. Now that they can just walk across the street as opposed to go miles out of the way to get around uh, the infrastructure, a lot of trips don't need to be as long. And there are modeling tools that can help uh, uh, transportation engineers and the public understand this. And lastly, uh, it would require federal agencies to issue guidance. Um, too many communities suffer the burden of infrastructure barriers without the political or economic power to oppose harmful projects and secure beneficial investments. And meanwhile, the federal government spends billions in formula discretionary funds, often per perpetrating the cycle of harm to communities. So to break this cycle and better target investments, this proposal requires DOT to conduct a broader study with the support of state DOTs and impacted cities, identifying the communities with infrastructure that creates barriers to mobility. Um, and they don't have to be interstates, like I said before. And measuring the degree of harm to that community. And this study will culminate in the creation of a national map of communities torn apart by infrastructure and will help prioritize resources for the communities harmed by these obstructive highways in the future. So with to sum up, we want less of this, yet another example of an incredibly wasteful use of land in terms of economic activity, and more of what we hope will come from a proposal like this. From this, we're gonna move into a panel discussion, and unfortunately, I have to share with you that uh, Mary Skelton Roberts will not be able to join us today uh, due to some technical difficulties in allowing her to join this conversation. Um, I would like to say before uh, moving on to the panel 
that uh, the reason we invited Mary, who is uh, moving into a position as senior vice president for programs at the Energy Foundation, is because of much more than the positions listed in her bio, but the role she has played uh, in the Barr Foundation, in Massachusetts, and within the funder community to elevate the importance of the built environment in public health, climate, and equity outcomes. She has been a leader and a change agent, and we're really lucky to work with her, and it's a loss that we don't get to uh, hear from her today. But the good news is I do have a wonderful panel who uh, is going to help me explore these issues more deeply. We have Dr. Destiny Thomas, the founder and CEO of the, the Thrivance Group. We have Melvin Giles, who is the community leader and advocate in the uh, Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul, which we're gonna spend some time really focusing on. Uh, and Minnesota State Representative Rena Moran. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, have Dr. Thomas uh, talk about how uh, our history has brought us to today. Racism is rooted in the origin and implementation of the interstate highway system, as well as so many other uh, infrastructure programs. Um, as a founder of uh, Thrivance Group and creator of the Urbanist Assembly, which both seeks to expose racism and planning, I'd love to ask you to level set this conversation. What should our audience know about the history of transportation planning and racism? And what are the motivations behind the creation of the highways in the past and today? Yeah, well, thank you, Beth. I thought that the um, historical outline that you just provided was uh, spot on. What I'll add is a lot of folks don't realize that um, city planning or city making as a profession um, is fairly new to this country. Um, and that the impetus for all city planning is rooted in transportation planning. The reason for that is because for a very long time, probably arguably still today, um, the point of transportation planning was rooted in freight, right, and economy, the movement of goods and cargo. Our country's uh, original cargo is the movement of Black bodies, right, which at the time weren't considered um, human and, and were strictly considered goods. Uh, when you look at property law today, when you look at, um, I think they call it the bundle of rights in real estate, you'll find that even the way we describe property still sounds a lot like the legacy of chattel, chattel slavery in this country, right? That's an important detail that we cannot skip over. Um, the origin story for transportation planning um, stems from the exploited and forced labor of Black bodies and the refusal to acknowledge Black people um, as human beings in this country. Another thing that's important to note in particular, as it particularly uh, relates to the uh, interstate highway system, is that all of our country's highways are built above um, sacred um, burial grounds, Native American burial grounds. And so even as we have this discussion about uh, what it will mean to remove, redesign, redesign or replace that infrastructure, we have to have a very real conversation uh, with environmental planners, which is actually my background, um, about how we are, how even that work um, is harmful, um, disrespectful, and contributes to the legacy of racism. The other thing um, which stems in, is, is connected to environmental racism is that these systems and this infrastructure have been in place for so long, um, spanning across and through black and brown neighborhoods that the land uh, and soil and walls and buildings adjacent to these highways are now also toxic. So it's not just a conversation about how and when we remove infrastructure it's really a conversation about how we, in a comprehensive and complete way, um, heal um, the literal um, land and infrastructure throughout the communities that have been impacted. The other thing that I wanna make sure I bring up regarding the legacy of racism in transportation is that even as transportation planning has evolved um, to, um, in a pseudo way, uh, be focused on the movement of human beings through space. Um, for many black and brown folks, transportation infrastructure and the technology that we affix to it 
um, is really just about surveillance um, and policing the movement of black bodies. So the criminalization of mobility, um, the dehumanization of people with disabilities and mobility challenges, um, and the pathologization of um, black people using transit infrastructure um, are all connected to this issue of removing um, or replacing the interstate highway system in these communities, right? And I think that you pointed out, and I'll wrap up in a second. I think you pointed out um, that we do run the risk of um, over relying on the mechanisms that have been in place to plan interstate highway systems to create other interventions, right? Like arterial roadways. I would argue um, that we are still using those ideal ideologies and mechanisms to plan transit, to plan bike bikeways, to plan pedestrian infrastructure, um, all of which are also tearing up black and brown communities um, and and re causing us to relive the legacy of slavery and racism in this country. So it's not just about the highways, it's the mechanisms by which the highways were built that I hope we can focus on today. You make an excellent point. Uh, we can argue whether what the intention was in the 1950s with a lot of these tools, but quite frankly, the best tools in the 1950s should be an embarrassment to use today. We have yeah. a lot more uh, skill and technology and ability to test uh, our systems now than we did then. In air quality, they test their models every year to see where there's a, a difference between what they expected and what happened. In transportation, we have not done really much of anything to update these tools in 70 years and you're absolutely right we're using the tools that were developed to figure out where to put the highways and how wide to make them to design transit it's just it's preposterous yeah. and uh and of course it results in terrible impacts uh, it could hardly be avoided um i really appreciate your perspective and i think uh each point you make is so important to show how layered this issue is and how deeply entrenched a lot of our decision making is in our history. Yeah. I'm going to focus a little more deeply on uh, the example that we want to focus on uh, from St. Paul, um, the Rondo neighborhood. Uh, Melvin, I'm going to uh, turn to you first. Our, our audience members may or may not be aware uh, with the uh, uh, the situation in Rondo. They probably are aware of one of the uh, highways in their own community and, and like me, be deeply invested uh, in seeing something fixed at home. But I, I would, I'm hoping you can familiarize us with what happened in your community with the construction of I-94 and how it impacts folks today. Yes, hello, Beth. And hello, I must say hello, America, across the nation. And I uh, want to thank Smart Growth America for this beautiful summit they've been doing. I've been enjoying the past two days. Uh, listening to Dr. Thomas is like, man, she said everything already, you know, uh, which is really good. But what I really love, what she acknowledged, is the land that we are on. Uh, and I send greetings from Minnesota but more so from all our first. We have many nations here in Minnesota. This is the land. If I say anything today, I would just tell people we need a critical mass right now about the pipeline number three. And this is one of those simple things, which is part of transportation. Our original, you know, we're talking about the 50s, 40s, 60s right now, but we need to go back and again, I appreciate Dr. Thomas mentioning our black bodies being coming all the way across to this country in bondage. But before we got here, there were some other folks here and they had their land. And that's when that transportation started chopping down trees, taking over land. And right now, I would say probably we need that critical mass because climate change, but more so just human beings. So if you don't know anything about Pipeline 3, just Google it in, okay? Tell our new president, you know, one of the first things he can do, he has kind of put a pause on the other pipeline, but in Minnesota, North Dakota, at Standing Rock, we know water is life. So I say that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and again, my name is Melvin, and I'm from Rondo. Yeah, uh, it's the beloved community, and we have beautiful people. And I will share some background with you, uh, but I really want to give honor to, man, I live in the state where our Lieutenant Governor, hey, she's First Nation. I live in a city, capital city, where we got, some people call him Little Obama, I call him MC3, Melvin Carter the third Black man, yeah. Rondo neighborhood, our city council person, Dai Tao, I think he's kind of brown, yes. Um, our, our attorney general, he definitely is black, Ellis Keith, Mr. Ellis. Okay, so things are changing. And so for me, I'm gonna pass on to Rena and she can pass it back. And then I will give a quick, like a minute introduction with a video about Rondo. But I definitely am so honored that our state rep, and I don't know how long she's been in office, but she looks too young <laughs> for all the years she's been in office. So uh, if I can do that, Beth, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Representative Moran, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Melvin, um, uh, for your introduction. I am a grandmother, right? A mother of seven and a grandmother of eight. Um, but yes, um, and I've been in the legislature for 10 years. I want to make a, a quick um, intro, uh, a quick correction around my title. <clears throat> I'm no longer the chair of Health and Human Service Policy. I am now the chair of Ways and Means Committee, which oh. is one of the most powerful committee in the Minnesota legislature. So that any bill, that's right. So any bill that has a fiscal note attached to it will have to come through my committee. And um, as a, a black legislator, um, as one who represents a very diverse community, one who knows the inequities that have been handed down from generation to generation to gener generation, that in my committee as chairs and ways, I introduce to my chairs, which has, my committee has most of the chairs of other committees and other leaders to say to them that when a bill comes to my committee, I will be expecting you to tell me the impact that your these bills are having on racial equity and the disparities that we see here in our committee and in, in our, in our uh, city. And that is important. Um, in Minnesota, we declared racism a health care crisis. And I also introduced this concept and I want to read to you because we talk about racism and for us as legislators, Racism is not about an individual act, right? Although we know people are racist, they, they discriminate, they are prejudiced, their biases shows up. But the definition that we use in our report was racism is a system, not an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing. It is a, a system of power that structures opportunity, whether that's education, housing, job, or justice and it assigns value, worth, or being unworthy, full of potential or full of menace based on the so-called race. So it's a social interpretation of how we work. And so when I talk about racism, I am talking through the lens of a policymaker who are looking at, who is looking at institutional racism and systemic racism. And we as legislators across this country as a government has an obligation and responsibility to begin to do undo the harm that government has caused communities across the, 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 across the nation. It is our responsibility to undo that through policies that create practices that we see back in our communities, right? That's our responsibility. And so I just want to start there because in the Rondo community, like what happened across the country, we had um, a thriving black community, families, businesses, home ownership, you know, relationship connections, building blocks. And we had a government that decided intentionally in ways that government has done things in the past is to do it without a community knowing it until it happened to them 
And then we tried to figure out what happened. And so like what happened across the country as government came in in the last minute after all the plans were said and done and said to these homeowners, we're going to claim eminent domain on your home and we're going to take it and here's a little money, but you have to move, right? That happens. And so what you have is that impact of the late 50s early 60s is still the impact that we're feeling today. We're still recovering from that. And so um, as a lawmaker, as a state legislator who looks through my work uh, through a race equity lens, being really conscious of fighting for social racial economic injustice, and then not just making that an ownership that I have to do, is introducing that concept to the body to say that this is the way, because we're the majority, we are fortunate enough to be the majority in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Um, and that is important because if you know anything about government at the state level and at the um, national level, it is those who have the majority who has the power to create the change that we want. And so we at this moment in time here in Minnesota, where we are utilizing and building the power that we have as legislators of color. There's currently 27 legislators of color in the Minnesota House of Representatives. So we have to set the foundation. Community has to set the foundation for what needs to be moved through a systemic racist system to make that system more fair and equitable. And so I don't know how much I need to talk about the Rondo. You got a picture of the Rondo community. We're looking at the, we know the inequities, and now we are in the um, the middle of looking at and rethinking uh, in, in Minnesota is 94, the highway east and west that comes to our community about rethinking I-94. And it's so interesting because I was late today to do a sound check because I was in our capital investment committee where it has been chaired by an Asian legislator who is also talking about racial equity or inequities and is going to be leaving his capital investment committee through a race conscious lens and what happened today is that our white legislators are not going for this they're trying to push back right because power never want no one never want to give up their power right or their worldview and what we had was really racist marks that was been stated in that committee trying to focus around individualism, right? Instead of looking at the institution of how we are always investing in capital gains across the state of Minnesota. We are investing in infrastructures across the state of Minnesota. We are investing in roads and bridges and transportation across the state of Minnesota. And if we are not informed, informed about the past, we continue to repeat the past. And so we are not going to go in this legislative session not being informed, not knowing the harms of the past, but setting that foundation right now in order to do the work that we need to do to move forward. And so I will stop there. I hope I have another chance to talk a little bit I'm more not, about We have lots of time to talk. Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, and do I, Malcolm, need... I believe uh, you wanted to present uh, a video at this point, correct? Uh, if, if, unless Dr. Thomas wanna quickly respond real quick. Oh, I wanna, I wanna see your video. Okay, <laughs> um, and I again wanna thank uh, Smart Growth America people particularly the tech people, man, you fantastic. Also May, who has set this up. But John, if you can go ahead and um, put this video on, it's a little background about Rondo, but more so about the destruction. Thank you.
people lost their John, homes. John, you can take that video down now. My father lost his home. All of my friends that lived across the street from me, all of their houses were gone. I didn't really know what they were. Here we go. Melvin, is there anything you want to add to that? I think the pictures, again, uh, tell so much. Uh, and uh, But I'd love to hear anything else you want to share about uh, the impact of, of that uh, that highway even today. Yeah. You know, I kind of just mentioned John's name as far as technology. And even what just happened, it was trying to tell everyone to listen, listen, listen. You know, uh, but as Councilperson McDuffie mentioned yesterday, we all know what the problem is. And what we've seen happen all across America, your presentation, Beth, that you showed, I mean, Atlanta, you know, I I never seen Atlanta looking like that. You know, I, I remember going to Clark University and just thinking the highways was that way. There's many folks who are living in the Rondo neighborhood who wasn't aware of the Rondo community. But our panel is about doing solutions. You know, we know the problems, we need to leap forward. And one of the things that's happening here in the Twin Cities is a group called Reconnect Rondo. And they've been working for at least the past four or five years on basically a Rondo land bridge. If we were living out in Washington State or Oregon, they would call it a lid. But it's like a land bridge. So can you imagine putting, when I first heard this, I was like, what the heck are you talking about, man? Putting a, some land on top of a bridge? But man, it is so real. If you can imagine having a food force in the middle of our neighborhood, if you can have it anchored by a couple of greenhouses, and we all know that the sunshine is free. I think they call those things solar gardening. Part of the work that we have to do with redefining where we are going for the future is looking at just simple simple things and the wisdom for us it does come from indigenous people it starts that's the roots and if we can just start doing some healing in my bio it mentioned i'm a certified racial sobriety uh, trainer facilitator and the, and the baseline is that is that people live in america I think in the whole world, we are racially dysfunctional and we all need an intervention. I don't care what color you are. We all need to start thinking differently. And part of thinking differently is just reclaiming who we truly are. You know, that we are not just human doings, we are human beings. And that's a lesson that First Nation people can help us to recall. And I know how black folks are, man. We got so much rhythm. It's just, my father was a, minister and i give thanks to him and to my brothers who we love touching the ground we grow stuff we have a sister up here robin hickman she likes to remind people that the oppressor you know they try to crush us but they forgot that we were seeds and we continue to grow and so in rondo right now what's going on is good conversations about how can we reclaim that rondo neighborhood it's, it's not that we can make it like it was, and there's we need to have some, and we do have, we have Rondo days where we remember. But sometimes we just have to have a funeral. We have to learn how to grieve and get over it. And part of racial sobriety is saying that we have to get out of our denial, go through our anger, do our bargaining. It's the grieving process. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Thomas. Well, I was actually going to ask Representative Moran real quick to just say when we're talking about, you know, in, in those conversations in the legislature about uh, rectifying these errors and, and people feel like something is being taken from them, how do you remind people of the community that is there that has just as much of a need uh, uh, for investment and, and benefit as the people traveling through? Yeah. So one of the things that <clears throat> we're doing, and um, I think we now have um, six or seven legislators who are over different committees. We we have we have formed what we call our People of Color Indigenous Caucus, which we call I don't know how people take this, but it's called our Posse Caucus. We come to clean up, you know, 
And so by having six of our posse members who are chairs of like the education committee, uh, capital investment, judiciary, public safety, myself, ways and means, and, I'm, uh, and homelessness, right? Those were all, and so it's very important that we first be strategic about delivering a message, a message that is consistent about the inequities, right? About racism, about structural racism, about systemic racism, and right, informing our colleagues, you know, Democrats and Republicans about the, the harms of the past. Um, and so like today, when we're in a committee that we can hear through our colleagues, um, you know, not their concerns, but kind of like that anger, you know, one of our colleagues, we had a, a white presenter from the University of Minnesota presenting, and she said, you know, that um, uh, I am a white person who cannot speak for these communities of color. And he, you know, asked a question was like, so are, you know, wait a minute, did, did I hear you say that you are kind of like ashamed to be white? Are you apologizing for being white? You don't need to apologize for being white. And, you know, and so, and instead of like responding to him, we have to stay focused on our vision and our purpose of again, the inequities, the, the structure, the laws. These were like intentional, like Jim Crow laws. You know, slavery was real. You know, taking the land from my indigenous folks was real. You know, with World War II and, and then Japanese encampment, you know, just to remind them. And because of the laws and policies of lawmakers who put these things into law that intentionally left out or had a, a negative impact on our community, we as lawmakers have an obligation to when we talk about making things right for all people or making decisions about how we're gonna move our state forward through, you know, whether it's capital investment, whether it's through educational outcomes, first, we need to listen to the, the communities that have been most impacted by them systems because they do have solutions about mm -hmm. what works and what does not work, you know, uh, that we have to, what we're gonna be used is called a racial equity impact assessment tool. And I said to all of my chairs, every last one of them, that this is a tool that we want you to be using when bills come to your body, of coming to your committee, so that as lawmakers, we don't continue to create harm for these communities that have been left, that have been left out of the process, did not get, whether it's for a, a land trust, whether it's for making sure that we have more after school programs, what do we need to do, especially in the era of COVID-19 that we are in, that we are having a tour that allow us to, you know, allow many to have a tool available. Because if you don't know what racism is, or you don't know what systemic looks like, systemic racism look like, or if you don't know that you are creating something that may have an un maybe intentional or unintentional impact on someone else, we're going to give you a tool to use that. But it's really just staying really clear with um, our legislators, you know, who don't seem to care or value uh, uh, diversity of, of visual appearance or diversity of thoughts or diversity of law or diversity of how we as a legislature need to operate, it is to be very, very, try as much as we can to be as strategic as we can, you know, and keep it on, um, as um, Ms. Donna said in that video, if you don't know your past, right, one, we are, we will continue to repeat it, or we cannot quite see our future in a clear enough vision that we need to see it. So policies, and practices and important. And what I try to do as a, as a legislator is not to, to do much of anything without having my community be engaged in this legislative process. As much as we hate government, as much as we don't trust government, we cannot allow government to make decisions about our community without us being at the table and making decisions with them, right? With them. We can attack, we can complain, 
but we have to be at the table making decisions, whether it's your city council member, your county commissioner, your parks and recs, or your state legislators, or congressional. We need to be building relationships with them so that when I have something or your legislature has something they're working on, the first person they think about will be Destiny Thomas to come and call up and say, what do you think about this? How should I move this bill? And what does it look like? We Let's need call to Dr. Thomas uh, right now. And uh, right. You know, we, we've referred to the fact that a lot of our planning, uh, even today, uh, is, is infected with many of the uh, uh, the, the bad decisions of the past and the, the bad intentions of the past. I think uh, Representative Moran said something very insightful, which is uh, sometimes it's intentional, but sometimes it isn't. And I'm hoping you can help us move from the problems of day into some potential solutions by helping us identify what are those things that are in transportation decisions and planning now that even unintentionally will move us in a direction that is not necessarily what we mean towards more pain and more uh, inequity. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I'm not sure that I agree that there are there is such thing as an unintended oh, consequence yeah. or impact. Um, I think that our willful um, ignorance or negligence um, is you just our fear of, of facing the facts um, that are tied to the history and legacy of planning. And I think that um, folks have heard, probably heard me say before that I think transportation and planning in this country is really just about appeasing white comfort. Um, our highway system, in addition to moving goods and cargo, was built um, to, to create um, suburban areas for white people that didn't feel um, comfortable living near the so-called undesirables in the city center, right? So an example of present day planning practices or ideology that will have what people will say are unintended impacts is um, this new push towards uh, density in urban centers, right? And <clears throat> we understand density oriented planning or planning or transit oriented planning to mean that we're creating complete communities and complete streets and, and locating um, transportation um, options out beyond cars um, directly in communities so that folks ha don't have to travel as far and have access to jobs and food and so on and so forth. That, that's density. What we haven't addressed is the issue of overcrowding in urban centers um, that stems from the intentional ghettoization of black neighborhoods and brown neighborhoods, right? So if we're not careful to understand and acknowledge that intention, we will begin to conflate density with overcrowding, which we're already seeing, right? In addition to that, um, by not having black practitioners at the table to do the planning work, to do the policy making work, um, not having black investors, not having black consultants um, or brown consultants, um, <clears throat> what we will see is what we've seen in California with our high-speed rail um, that still hasn't been built. Um, but I work with Black elders all the time in the Central Valley who can tell me the story about when eminent domain came in and wiped out their entire community for the purpose of implementing high-speed rail, which was, was promising at the time, we said, would connect people to jobs um, and, and to quality and dignified housing. That land is now brownfield all up and down the, the Central Valley of California. The only thing that you will find that is populous, highly, highly populated, is the prison system in the Central mm -hmm. Valley, um, mm -hmm. or that it's concentrated, is the prison prison system. And so I think the it is the lack of perspective, lived experience, um, and just cultural know-how and empathy at all of the various tables that these practices stem from. I think more specifically um, is to stop thinking about transportation just as an opportunity to move people quickly and at low cost. I think um, because of the um, multiplicity of need and, dis and, and um, despair really in black and brown communities, we have to start thinking um, about this from a um, interdisciplinary 
perspective, right? So a, a, trans, a train station or a bus shelter should not just be that, right? It's not just about how we get people out of their undesirable community to a, a more desirable one to, to work for eight hours and then come home tired. Um, why isn't that bus shelter providing high speed network, high speed internet for the community that it's located in? Why, where did this um, conversation around not wanting bus shelters to actually provide shelter for unhoused people stem from? Why are our train stations just train stations and not places where we can get fresh produce, programmatically places where we can get fresh produce or seek mental health um, interventions, right? So it's, it's because these issues are so longstanding and have created a ripple effect, a domino effect of, um, of reduced quality of life in these communities, we have to start thinking about how we take a, a multifaceted approach to understanding what it means to invest in any type of infrastructure in these same communities. I love that point about it's not just about moving people quickly to where opportunity exists. How can we move the opportunity closer to the people? And it does seem in transportation, we have refused to view that other, uh, that investment in the community as a way to get people where, where they need to go more quickly as a, a viable alternative. Um, yeah. I, I, intra, like intra, intra, I just will add that intra-community connectivity is um, important to the vitality of folks who culturally, um, it, it is a necessity, right? There are some folks whose spiritualities and belief systems require them to be connected to their neighbors um, and to their family members um, and be in close proximity, right? Black folks, brown folks, Southeast Asian folks, we take pride in being able to live near our elders, our parents as we grow older, that we want them to see us growing older. We need to be able to access them quickly. Intra-community connectivity is just as important, if not more so, as transporting a person 20 miles away on a train, albeit moving quickly, um, to just, um, be a laborer for 10 hours, right? And then come home and not have anything to offer their community um, in a substantial or spiritual or cultural way, right? And and maybe this isn't about um, generating profit or revenue from ridership, which has also been a flaw in our planning um, and our thinking around transportation planning. Maybe this isn't an economic argument that, that maybe there isn't an economic argument to be made here. Um, but I'm hoping that the pandemic has shown folks that if we aren't investing in quality um, of life and connectivity, community, intra-community connectivity, um, then everything else is fleeting, right? So, so maybe we stop looking at this as a business case and start looking at it as a public good. It is, it is a public good, yeah. Yeah. Well, can, can I, I would like to throw out a question to anybody because we've we've spoken about the need to be, bring people up from different backgrounds and different cultures into the system of planning itself, but we've also talked about how important it is to involve the community being affected in decisions being made that that uh, will will determine how well that community functions. Having said that, that's a big ask of that community. And, and of people who work hard and have their their own uh, issues they have to deal with. And so, um, you know, just speaking as a transportation nerd who also finds it difficult to get to community meetings and participate in the system because, you know, I work and I have kids and I have a household to take care of and all the normal life things that make this challenging. I'd love for you all to talk about uh, examples of successful ways to engage communities and make it uh, possible and friendly and, and easier for that community to be part of the decision making uh, process, even if it was um, a momentary piece of progress that maybe hasn't fixed the whole problem just yet. So I can start. Um, um, but can I say this first before I start that because I heard Dr. Thomas mention say the word uh, undesirable places. And I keep, you know, the question is, why are there undesirable places at first, right? Uh, I, I, uh, Albert Einstein said that he had one hour to solve a problem. He would spend 55 minutes looking at the problem and just five minutes with the solution. Because problems are, what is the root cause? We got to dig down deep. We got to turn it over. We got to look from the side. You know, often we see a problem. We just want to give an answer real quick, you know. So 
I just want to say that because I, I think it's very, very in, in, important. Um, so kind of the ways that I have found to be helpful with engaging uh, the community as the chair of Health and Human Service Community, when we was talking, I had a bill, you know, opioids was like, like, you know, we're at a rise around opioids and folks ODing on opioids. Um, it has, was really hitting the Native American community like really, really hard. So I took my hearing out to their community. And I had, you know, we partnered with folks from their community. We've they allowed them to find a location. You know, we took the whole committee. We invited them to testify and we went to them. And they was able to find the testifiers and and you know from the different tribes to to speak to us. Another way that I did it, recognizing that people are busy with their lives, they're working to they have kids, you know. And as a legislative body, we do our work during the daytime. You know, we start early and we definitely end before five o'clock, often we do, not always. But I decided that I was going to have a hearing in the evening and working with the community, you know, we decided that, and then I made it a little bit longer and I called it an informational hearing just so that folks can show up, testify, you know, because if it's something about the black community, you know, I learned early in my first term when I was in the public safety committee and the chair of public safety asked me if um, keeping resources for the Department of Human Rights is important, why don't we see anybody here? Why isn't community showing up if this is so important? I was like, whoa, right? And so I went on to talk about how people are busy in their lives. We don't have a process to give people proper notice. Um, but from that, I learned that if you want first, that is important that we show up, that we be engaged and, and then create a process that that can happen. And so I held a hearing in the evening, worked with a community organization for them to make sure testifiers that the community knew about it uh, around. And this was around children in out of home placement. Our child welfare system are removing our black kids from our homes in high numbers. They're putting them, you know, with foster parents out of their community, out of their schools, with everything they love or know, they are removing them away from that and then trauma show up. And then teachers want to know why our kids are going into school acting out when they've been removed from their homes. So um, those are two ways that we, we have to find ways if we want to be very intentional about engaging our community and let them be a part of the solution is to recognize that, you know, we have a system that is not compatible for real people's lives. And that's sure. very good advice. Uh, yes. Melvin, as a member of the community, talk to us about what, what makes it easier for you to pull your fellow community members in, but also just makes it easier for you to not just be a part of it, but be a productive part uh, of, of the decision-making process. Thank you. I would say, you know, the word joy. You know, <laughs> people know I blow peace bubbles. I like bubbles instead of bullets, number one but joy, we got to get out of our heads and get into our hearts. Yes. Uh, and I'm looking at some of the chat, so I want to do a shout out because that's what, we have to acknowledge people, you know? So let me do a shout out to the scorecard. Uh, that's a local group uh, working with the Alliance. They do policy stuff. I love that they do it because as state rep just said, you know, for some people like myself, that policy stuff is boring. Okay, I'm so glad we got some great lawmakers who will take care of that boring stuff, but will stop being boring when they start having some fun, when they start dancing, when they start sharing a meal. And so to answer your question, in 2014, um, after the uh, our so-called light rail was going to cut through our neighborhood again, and at one time they was calling it the Central Corridor. But because of what's happening in our community, it's, we're trying to not just complain about redlining, we are transforming it to greenlining. You know, we are creating spaces of growing food. We are creating spaces of growing wealth. But in 2014, another one of our great artists, farmers, say two Jones, he had this vision of a create the mill. And if you can imagine a half mile table a half mile table. Yeah, we had to put, I don't know how many tables together, a hundred of them, but 2,000 people sat down together, 2,000 people. And we had hundreds of volunteers serving food 
And these volunteers, man, they was like dancing as they serve people. You know, I tried to volunteer to be one. They just said, man, pick up a camera. You don't got no dance step. But it's about sharing food, growing food. Will Allen, who used to run the Growing Power, I recall when he told me one day, he said, Melvin, I know you really like doing these undoing racism workshops. And that's cool. But why don't you get in the garden, get your hands dirty with other people? Mm. We have to go where people are. And with mm. our gardening stuff right now, people are learning if they can grow some collard greens, they can go outside, pick that dollar collard greens, say $1, $2, $3. That's building wealth. Instead of taking it to some big chain store and giving it to them. So to answer that question again, we have to be able to go to where the people are. Make it fun. Make it fun. Go ahead, <laughs> Dr. That's great advice. I was actually, Dr. Thomas, I, I'm starting to turn to some of the questions that are showing up in the chat. And one of them is very fundamental uh, and reminds me of something that Melvin said that not everybody knows what happened. They, they grew up after the highway came through. So if someone wants to dive in and understand the details of how urban renewal and redlining and racist lending practices help shape their local community, where should they go for that information? Where are good sources to learn their own uh, community's history? I think there are a couple of places that you could go. Um, to be honest, I think YouTube has become a wonderful resource for, for me when I facilitate um, professional development um, regarding this subject matter. We rely heavily on YouTube videos. I will say that, um, you know, the erasure of communities that happened through the implementation of transportation infrastructure <clears throat> did not just stop at the implementation of the infrastructure. Um, those, those records were not kept. Um, there was an intentional effort to remove and erase archives, any of them that depicted the communities that existed before the infrastructure was put in place. Many times you will find that that information is gone. Um, this is why I always tell people when you get those um, renderings at your open house um, and when you have an opportunity to, to put public comment on the record, um, that's just not a ceremonial practice, right? Those comments become a part of an archive that uh, God willing won't be deleted at some point. So we have to do the work as community as well as as planners um, to understand that everything that we create, every rendering that we draw, every project description that we write is, is truly the work of an archivist. Um, these stories are missing. Um, the Where I have found these stories reco be recovered um, is through the work of photo archivists. Um, so a lot of times I will look at, um, you know, photo photographic archives that have nothing to do with urban planning and I will um, investigate the, the literal backgrounds in the images to understand how um, space has transformed over time. I will also add, um, I do wanna touch on community engagement because I am the community engagement queen. Okay. Um, so I will oh add God. that, <laughs> that one of the things that I really enjoyed um, during my time at the LA DOT was our, um, we were able to create what we called a dignity hub located directly in South Central LA uh, in an area that was unincorporated. So no um, no uh, council member could, could uh, have a say in what we did in the space. Um, and we were able to bring planning directly to the community in a way that wasn't trans transactional. Right, mm -hmm. so we weren't just there asking for specific input about this one street or this one project. We were there every day for eight hours investing in long-term relationships with the community. So there wasn't a learning curve when it did be, when it was time to talk about a specific project. We had been in communication. We had a relationship already. So um, us as planners, we weren't trying to figure out or grapple with what community wanted and community wasn't trying to grapple with the language and terminology that we were using. And then lastly, I'll say to that, um, it's also important to rely on our social services and safety net providers, um, the WIC office, the EBT folks, even the probation office, um, because those are folks that are interfacing with these same communities on a daily basis and in a more meaningful way. 
right? So the, the folks who that communities are already going to um, to get their vital needs met, um, those are the people that we should have at our um, our planning exercises in our charrette so that we can understand um, how to meet the holistic needs of the people um, in our project areas. I don't think anyone should be engaging community just about an infrastructure project, to be honest. It should be within the context of their lived experience. Yeah. So can I share a story? Please. Um, because, because, you know, I, I feel so honored and privileged so often to be to, uh, to be a state legislator, to have, you know, uh, opportunity to be a founding member of our Posse Caucus, you know, chairing our Posse Caucus, now the chair of our United Black Legislative Caucus, you know, to chair Health and Human Service now in one of the most powerful seats now as the Ways and Means chair. But, you know, and, and here I am talking about Rondo, right? And I wasn't. I didn't. I wasn't raised in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. I am a native of Chicago, Illinois, born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I am that little girl that saw my community. Here you go. That <laughs> saw my community. That was that was a reflection of me. When I went to my school, it was from you know neighborhood folks from this from from my community on my street. You know, when I saw my teachers, they was a reflection of me. I went to the local store around the corner on my block. You know, I saw that. So the one thing I do know is the power of black people. We are just powerful people and has not always been portrayed as so uh, in media and other places or treated fair or just. But uh, it's been like almost 20 years now. It seemed like just yesterday as a mother of seven with four black boys trying to figure out what, whether or not I wanted to raise my boys in Chicago. And, you know, decided after some, you know, and heard something about Minnesota that it was, you know, was a great, had a great educational system, family friendly. Cause I don't know no one that moved from cold to cold, right? Or intentionally do that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? But I, it was, that's where I was at that moment as a mother. And so I moved to Minnesota I did it quickly, didn't make good planning around what that looks like. And then I was homeless, living in a shelter for four months with my kids, right? Trying to navigate a system in the state that I knew nothing about and realized the system that I was trying to navigate didn't make sense neither because, you know, I was a mother who was homeless, who needed a job, but knew that and who, who really wanted housing, right? But knew in order to get housing, I needed a job. In order to get a job, I knew I needed childcare. In order to get childcare, I knew I needed some money. And you find yourself so inundated with so much stuff, not knowing where to start. That was me, right? Who had an aunt who said, you know what? I've been to Minnesota before. St. Paul is a good uh, place to start. Move to Minnesota. You know, that's what we do. We listen to our elders. I moved to Minnesota, right? I, I mean, I moved to St. Paul. And so as a new person to a new state who was like in a new place of mind for whatever reason, that's where I was, decided that I was gonna take some of those roots from back in Chicago where we had those black parties, where we knew our neighbors and said, as, as a mother of children, I have to get to know my neighbors. Right, because we're busy people, we're doing everything. We don't open our doors up, we don't sit on our porch no more, we don't let the shades up because we're so busy doing all the things we need to do. But those fundamental basic things about being connected to other people, being connected to your neighbors, taking responsibility for your block and what that looks like is still the basic values that we have to reconnect back to. Because I didn't want to be a mother who had four black sons moving to a new place that people would look at my four black sons on the sidewalk and say, hmm, them guys, or they may be selling drugs or they must be part of a gang. And just imagine my four black sons each have a friend with them. Now there's eight. Whoa, you know, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. And so it was really important to me that if someone were to see my sons doing something or my daughters, you know, I'm a mother of three daughters, that they would feel okay about knocking on my door and saying to me, Miss Rena, I saw Javon doing so and so and so and so. And I wouldn't react in a bad way because that's not the way I came up. We came out and elders were always there to protect us and also be the disciplinarians too, right? And so the destruction of the highways in many ways, in many communities around us, not only in Minnesota, around the country, took away that foundational values that we have as black people about being connected to each other, 
being responsible for one another. And sometimes I think it was a system that intentionally did that, right? That intentionally took away that foundation and that base and so much other stuff. And so I share that to just say that what I learned, what I did was that I, the basic need to connect to other people is still so important. I found a local nonprofit organization in my community who was looking for resident leaders. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to get to know people here and became a resident leader. But I found so much out about the Rondo community. I found out the history of Rondo community, but I also saw the value and power and power and all these powerful people saying that I would never let what happened to me before that happened to my mother or my grandfather or my aunt happen to us today because I am going to be engaged in the process. I am not going to let a green line that's now trying to come through our community, come through our community and pass us up without picking us up because we're going to organize around it. So those organizing tools in the basic foundation of knowing your neighbor, being connected to other people is still what I take into the capital. I'm like, you're going to see my community. What a lovely uh, approach. And I think exactly the mindset we're looking for government to have that they're first, they need to get to know their neighbor before they bring their, their ideas or solutions. They probably should talk with their neighbors and find out what the problems actually are. I think that's a great lens. We have a question uh, in the chat, um, which I, I, I think it's at something that several of you mentioned uh, earlier, which is there's a, when you when you seek a change, even a change to rectify a, a problem that's been created, someone always feels like they've lost something. Um, and I think, unfortunately, in this particular situation, um, it, it's a loss of a, a mild convenience as opposed to uh, the fabric of, of communities, a, a strange uh, trade-off when you say it out loud, a, a kind of an embarrassing trade-off. But as we're entering into these conversations, what are the strategies and messaging best practices for helping communities understand the benefits of doing something big and, and changing things in a way that uh, that may not be able to happen all at once, but but could lead the overall region in a better direction, even if it has initial inconveniences. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in and just say it definitely takes more than just will. It does take some skill. Uh, I, I love the brother Andre yesterday mentioning about the businesses who was complaining um, during this COVID shutdown. And he just threw it out there. He said, just imagine if you were shut out for two, 200 years. You know, <laughs> that's how it has been for people of color. But I would encourage people to, uh, to just start talking to each other. But they need to really get some training. There's great books out there right now. Uh, I love that Dr. Thomas mentioned the words fear and ignorance. You know, those are two stools, two uh, part of that three stool. and we have to get rid of our fear that was the number one thing about building on the pole and we got to let go of guilt we got to let go of shame and hold and blame um at the beginning we started talking about this is about healing and healing is a it's about self we have to stop pointing the fingers at other folks and just keep pointing it back at ourselves holding people accountable for sure but again i might really stress the word we need to grieve and um, simply, uh, I, I love white folks, I love black and brown folks. And so I have to just say, get over it, get over it, get over it. Talk to folks like Dr. Thomas, talk to Sister Marina, you know, but we are not your savior and we gotta <laughs> stop. We, we can't keep teaching. Uh, Sometimes my white brothers and sisters just have to just step back. And I'm so happy in Minnesota, some of them are learning it. That's why we are doing some great things here. I would I would add to that. Um, I I think that there are a number of issues, sociological ones that we're facing in this country, um, which will require us to um, step away from the negotiation table. Um, I do think we have done too much negotiating around human decency. Um, and I think in the same ways um, 
that it's time to stop negotiating about how to help and meet the needs of our unhoused communities. I think it's time again to stop looking at transportation planning as a commodity. Um, and you know, just imagine how irrational it would seem if your city, the city that you lived in, had to pass you know five different uh, ordinances and bills and vote on propositions just to get water flowing through a pipe, right? Like water is public resources. It's a public utility. Transportation is a public utility. And I know we live in a country that um, prides itself on consensus building and democracy, uh, but sometimes the majority does not know uh, what is best, particularly for people who um, are always receiving the short end of that de de democracy stick, right? And so we've, we've tested democracy out, the democracy ex exercise when it comes to mobility and transportation planning, it's not working. Um, a lot of folks have done amazing work to quantify and to qualify where our needs are when it comes to, um, you know, ideas for prioritizing transportation uh, related resources. The work has already been done. All we need is bold um, and willing leaders to step in and do, do what needs to be done, right? And, and it's not about your political ideology at this point. People are suffering, people are dying. You could also um, I often tell people, you can map um, the population of unhoused communities um, across this country um, beneath your highway infrastructure, as well as adjacent to your transit infrastructure. There's a reason for that, right? And, and I think that continuing to politicize um, and over commodify um, mobility is, is probably a fatal flaw. I'd also like to take moderator's prerogative to, to share my opinion about this. And, and that is that uh, when, when you're approaching something to change it, people reflexively uh, uh, reject it because frankly, uh, humans throughout human history uh, have been put in danger by change. So it's a natural reaction to not like the idea of change and to question it. However, we can remind them that they don't actually like this system. There's almost nothing people complain about more than transportation. And reminding them that they're not actually getting any convenience out of the system that's doing damage to other people uh, is it not a bad start. Uh, the other thing is to point out to them that uh, uh, what a lot of state DOTs are offering them by maintaining these highways or expanding them has only brought more inconvenience is also a not a bad thing to remind them that if if uh, I mean we are traveling longer and further than ever before, uh, I believe that we've added something like four extra miles per person uh, uh, per day uh, to our travel since the 90s. So if if you don't think you're traveling enough or spending enough money on transportation or time in your car, uh, following uh, the recommendations that we've used for the last 50 to 70 years is a great way to go. But maybe we don't like this, and maybe remind folks of it. I'd also want to mention that in Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, they have uh, something called the Accessibility Observatory and have really pioneered uh, work in measuring how many jobs and essential services people can get to by all modes of travel. Now imagine if instead of measuring how fast cars go, which is what the basis of all transportation decision making, like Dr. Thomas mentioned, we measure where people can get to no matter how they travel. And not just whether or not travel is convenient along that highway corridor, but whether or not we're providing access for people trying to get across the highway corridor. Just by putting some numbers to it can expose a lot of these issues. And I would, I would say that that's not a bad way to enter into these conversations as well. I, I think the lesson that we can't forget from 2020 is that we saw 50%, 49% of this country be willing to literally die from a pandemic because their racist and xenophobic ideologies are more important to them than convenience, than rational thinking, than their lives, right? So I, I, this is, yes, I agree with everything that you're saying, Beth, but I also know firsthand what it is to work in a sector 
that is rife with people who are willing to die with racism gripped between their fingers, um, even knowing that the system we have does not benefit them. As long as it is also not benefiting my black body, they're fine with that. And I think, I think that is really where we move away point. from the negotiation table. So what do we do? We don't want to set up a system that makes it easy to exclude people because then we could be right back here when other people are in charge being excluded. So what, how do we, what are the tools we use to move around them that is, uh, like, like I've said before, one of the, the flaws that I find in a lot of uh, administrations trying to change things is they get so enamored with their own ability to manage a poor program better that they don't make permanent change that makes the program better. So yeah, how, I'm, what I'm do we sorry, do to yeah. make the program better? <laughs> That we do want to remove those folks who want to keep those toxic attitudes, okay? Those folks, it, it, even for us, it's not about saving nobody, you know? And thank you, Dr. Thomas. Folks who are just, who has that toxic thinking, they just need to be in that toxic area. Rondo, right off that freeway, it's the highest number of asthma cases probably in the country. And those are little black kids, little brown kids, little white kids, just because of all that emission going. And then we got other folks saying climate change and we got people saying, oh no, that's not real. It's like, that's toxic thinking, you know? And so, excuse me for cutting you off, but when I hear somebody say, okay, we have to accept these people, no way do we have to keep thinking, accepting white supremacy thinking, this is 2021, we know what to do. This is George, the center of George Floyd murder up here in the Twin Cities. This year, all across last year, the whole world, I think people were so surprised to see all the white folks waking up, getting out in the streets and saying, hey, something's wrong here. And that for me is very positive that we are getting to that critical mass. Where there's enough people saying, hey, your thinking is crazy. You know, if you really want to do a pipeline, take it through Bismarck. Why do you want to take it through our neighborhood? You know, if you really want to do something, take it somewhere else. We are learning how do we flip the question. And by flipping it, it's not always catering it to the majority, as Dr. Thomas said. But we need yeah. to flip it to just common sense and love. We got to. Oh man, love is so hard. Forgiveness is so hard. Melvin, we need practice. some problems. Well, you know, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm not quite sure what common sense is because some people that's up for interpretation for so many different people, right? Um, gosh, what was I going to say here? Um, so I, I think you know, again, we are in a moment in time, and it is our moment today with the death of George Floyd that, that woke so many people up, who for some reason, as black folks always known that police, we know the history of policing in America. You know, we know that, you know, it was created to keep us as slaves and runaways and that was their job. And we knew that you know, once they took off their white hoods, they put on police uniforms. And so when black, when black men, women, children were getting killed, for some reason, you know, you have people who would think, you know, white people would think, well, they must have did something wrong. That's why it happened. We got cameras. I mean, some people are still saying that with George Floyd and we saw him take his last breath and they still say, oh, it wasn't from that police knee on his neck blocking his airway. It was because of, he must have had COVID-19. That's what happened. Stuff like that, right? But we are in a moment in time where the reality, where people are seeing that we have to do nothing. We're just on arm, just laying and we, we're dying. And so the civil rights movement was all about Black folks standing up, having a voice and said, no longer, right? No longer. We just want to be treated equal. We'll move from equal to equity now, but we just want to be equal, right? And so we've been sitting 
for the last 50 plus years on the movement of the civil rights movement. It is time for us today of, of good conscience of people who know that we're still sitting in those inequities. Institutional racism is real and that it is our moment in time to move us into the future, not only for ourselves, but for our kids and for our grandkids. That is who our ancestors were and that is what they were fighting for. They weren't just fighting for this moment in time. It's to create us the future. And so when we think about transportation, it is our moment to look at the inequities of the transportation and the impact it had on our community, specifically black communities, community of color, they just went right through. You know, I'm not the expert on transportation. I really am not. But what I do know, you know, the folks are talking about, you know, transportation, as Dr. Thomas and Melvin both said, transportation is not a silo issue. It is about housing. It is about the environment for Black people. Environment is not just about air and water. It's about land. It is about our school. It is about our stores. It's about our that is environmental justice. And so it is our moment now to override the nonsense. And Representative Moran, in, in this moment, this incredible moment that we can seize, and as someone who often is charged with turning these ideas into institutional realities, how do we remove these toxic voices from our public programs? Uh, how do we empower folks who might be up against a majority in a democracy to get that change? I think whether we're in, see, we as Black people are used to being a minority, right? So when you talk about minority, majority, we right. are, we're used to that. And so that doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, every movement that has been created has been created for, because of people standing up, standing up, marching, protesting. It has never been, been because and those people or elected official created the change. We forced them to come to the table and do the right thing. And so that is still the power today is for ordinary everyday people to continue to stand up, have their voices heard, show up in these places where these toxic voices are at, bring some, I'm gonna put this word in here now, bring some common sense into the work that we need to be doing, right? That is about all of us, show the inequities, stand strong on what we believe is gonna move us into the future. We have to keep continue. It's to me, things are like, you know, I think we sometimes we want to be up here in our head somewhere real high, but I think sometimes it's just basic stuff. We still, it's still about, it's still, it's still about organizing. It's still about bringing people together around a collective voice and a collective vision. It is still about, we know people know right from wrong, wrong. Power is not, people don't want to conceive their power. And it's all about their power. It's not, it has nothing to do with right or wrong. It's just about them holding on to what they have and have always had. We just need to continue to show up and change the system that I talk about that, you know, racism is a system. Yes, a, a, you know, uh, there's a power of structure and an opportunity. Whether it's our education system, our housing system, our transportation system, they are all interconnected. We don't live our lives just about transportation. We live it around the environment. We live it around housing. We live it around so many other issues. They are intercepted and we have to be more committed to not just focus on transportation, but the impact it has on all of those things because there are injustices within all of those systems that we have put before us. So I just think it's a, it's a people power movement and people just gotta continue to just show up and lift up their voices and make us do what we need to be doing to move us into the future. Yeah, Dr. I Thomas, think we need, yeah, I think we need, uh, first of all, let me point this out. These cities and municipal agencies know how to override the will of a majority. They do it in black neighborhoods all the time. Mm -hmm. So use the same mechanism you've been using, just do it in, in the interest of a different community this time. Secondly, I think what we really need is um, a bold statement from the federal level. Um, I think we should call it reparations. I think we can definitely implement a comprehensive package for reparations through urbanism uh, while we continue to move the conversation forward about other types of rep uh, uh, reparations and to whom it is due. Um, I think that 
calling something, naming something like transportation investments, reparations really sets the tone and the agenda um, for um, the level at which we should be resourcing this, how to bring it to scale, um, and, and the prioritization system that we should um, undertake in order to do it. What I, what I would not like to see happen is what we saw happen with the rollout of high-speed internet across this country where we began to name the digital divide before we even had broadband infrastructure laid and still ended up with a digital divide. <laughs> so I think what Melvin is getting at is we've, we've become really good at naming and foreseeing what the harm will be, less interested in and less invested in actually preventing it from happening. And I think that that has a lot to do with who we allow to continue to sit at the table, to be in these rooms, and to lead these processes. And yes, folks will have to lose um, something. People are gonna have to give something up. And, and as Rep Representative Moran mentioned, um, black and brown communities, we're used to it, and we've done it gracefully for decades in this country. Just do it differently for a minute, and we'll start to see things improve. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask one more question from uh, the audience before we close out uh, and, and just a quick answer. Um, what are your thoughts about the role of emerging uh, infrastructure and urban development technologies and improving community engagement and decision making for those who are designing, building and operating cities? Uh, do you think that there are technologies that could make uh, some of these efforts easier uh, or uh, do you think it's really just a matter of organizing? I think that um, I have seen, actually there was a, um, a white paper that was just put out today. I've, I've worked in partnership with a couple um, uh, organizations in the tech industry to develop tools that will help practitioners, um, you know, be more insightful and be more equitable in their decision-making. I still think it boils down to who the practice, which which practitioner is using and accessing the technology. Um, I am more inclined toward and hope to see in the near future um, this same level of innovation um, go into community-based planning to provide that technology um, to communities. So, what would it mean to have um, those mapping tools embedded? in a digital kiosk at a bus station where, where a person while waiting for their bus could pin on the map um, other interventions that they'd like to see in that area or what their journey was like getting to that bus stop. Um, I, I think there are opportunities there. Um, but I also will say that um, I think the tech industry should be accountable for its impact on Black communities and the, the degradation of the the, the uh, already struggling transit infrastructure that we had in this country. Um, it is not lost on me that one week into this pandemic, before we knew it was a pandemic, um, several major tech companies said, you know what, we're going to close down in-person offices indefinitely. And this is after I spent two years um, rallying in my state to get transportation um, and capital funding programs to stop centering these same um, industries and these same companies in their transport long range transportation planning efforts. So I don't know how it is in Minnesota, but in California, we have an entire suite of newly funded transportation packages and projects that were built around um, getting Facebook employees from low income neighborhoods in East Oakland and West Oakland to San Francisco. Um, the same with Twitter, the same with Amazon, all of whom are now working from home and have no intention of returning to the office, right? So we've wasted a lot of resources on centering the wrong people in our work. So it's not just decentering and banning cars and vehicle traffic, it's decentering the people, right? And the likeness that inspired the, the over-reliance on cars and vehicle traffic to begin with. And that is the centering of white comfort that we need to face and get rid of in our planning exercise. I like the way you talk, Dr. Thomas, you know. Thank you, no, I like the way you talk too. Yeah, because there's no one solution, but when I think of technology and what you just said, and think about Minnesota, again, I'm gonna say the sunshine is free, 
the wind is free or basically alternative energy. That's one technology. But the best technology is right here in our hearts. Is again, uh, I use the Red Lake Nation up north. They ha are trying to teach Minnesota how do you live by the seasons. You know, if it's up here in Minnesota freezing time, it means ice fishing, for instance, or there could be time to harvest the rice. So very quickly, I would just say if we can live by the seasons, and depending on where you are, seasons change. And this is a peace pole. And I think we all need to learn how to become walking peace pole. The peace pole has the message, may peace prevail on earth in different languages. It's like we are all different, but we are all one. And for sure, black and brown people are not the minority. We are not minority, okay? So let's get over that stuff. We are the majority and we want everyone to join us. Okay, Rena, you got the last word. Well, yeah. I don't know if you guys gonna like my last word here because as I said before, um, I am not the, the expert on um, transportation, uh, but I do know what a mother of seven, when I did not have a car is what I use, right? Um, so I think modes of transportation are needed. Um, the, the question is, 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 is how are we doing it and where are we doing it and, and, how, and the impact it has on communities that it's going through. You know, I don't know whether that is an electric car, electric train, more clear. I, I, I don't have the solution, but I do know that it's important to engage those communities in that process, in these conversations. That I do know uh, that we can no longer continue to do work uh, as we think we're doing it for people and we need to start doing it with people. And so I would just want to end with that. Communication has to be the foundation of what that looks like. I think that's a very important place to end. And, and I tend to come down with Dr. Thomas that uh, new technologies have possibilities, but only if they're used to the proper ends by the right people. Technology is a tool and it can be used for good and for bad. Uh, and we've used past new inventions rather poorly. And so we shouldn't look for a technological fix. We should look for a, a leadership and policy fix. I, I want to end with something I heard uh, yesterday on a uh, panel I was on with a, a council person from uh, Tukwila, Washington, uh, a council person, Quinn, who said uh, he's seeking to help people get comfortable with discomfort. And only through being able to do that will we be able to have these conversations that we need to have and set up systems that are a little easier to work to use properly and maybe a little harder to work uh, poorly, but uh, really invest the neighborhoods being impacted with the power to to uh, set their own uh, uh, future and their own progress. So I really want to thank this panel uh, for your time, your wisdom, uh, and, and your your great interactions today. I wish we could have another hour together, and I look forward to seeing you all again. And Melvin, I'll never get enough of uh, the bubbles or the peace poll. I, I should just uh, start uh, stealing from you from uh, those excellent ways to to lighten and, and bring a little joy to a room. Thank you all so much, uh, and I'm going to turn things back over uh, to the host. I will just go ahead and, and jump on and, and close us out for today. Um, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for your participation uh, and, and staying engaged through these three days uh, of really exciting and excellent conversations. Um, I uh, want to thank every single uh, person who participated in the Equity Summit and our uh, uh, our sponsors as well. And uh, Michael, if you are available to uh, take us from here, I will turn it over to you. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. We froze for a second. 
with that, we're nearly at the end of Smart Growth America's Equity Summit. But before we finish, I, we want to mention a few resources that you may be interested in, along with Transportation for America's proposal to repair the damage created by the interstate highway system. Two other recent T4 America reports should be required reading in the new administration Congress as they start to produce long-term transportation policy this year. The con Congestion Con examines why our expensive strategies to reduce congestions are failing, while eliminating congestion might be the entirely wrong goal and how spending billions to expand highways can actually make congestion worse by encouraging people to drive far or more. And driving down emissions explores how our land use and transportation decisions are inextricably connected and explains how making it possible to drive less should be at the heart of our transportation climate strategy while building a more just and equitable society. All of these uh, publications can be found at t4america.org. We also want to note that in just a few weeks, Smart Growth America will be, will be releasing the 2021 edition of Dangerous by Design, which takes a close look at the epidemic of preventable fatalities of people stuck and killed while walking, which is disproportionately killing people of color. And with that, we'll pass it back to Calvin Gladney for one last word and one last time. Peace polls, bubbles. Love what we saw both today and over the last couple of days. Um, as Beth said, I wanted to thank our presenting sponsors, um, all of our sponsors, but in particular our presenting sponsors, City, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Maryland Department of Planning. Special shout out to you guys for your host activities as well, because without you, this summit couldn't be the success um, that it was. I want to specifically thank our speakers who really just made this, uh, I can't remember a time where I felt so energized, and I hope you as the audience um, felt that as well. And thank you, thank you for spending the time. I know you guys are all busy. Um, and you're busy because, you know, I was thinking about that um, quote that um, um, former President Barack Obama once said, which I actually believe is a quote from June Jordan, a poet. Um, but President Obama once said, um, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. And what I wanna leave you today with is, we're, we're not the ones that we've been waiting for because you guys have not been waiting. You've been out there doing the work, making the impact and making racial equity, economic inclusion and restorative justice, the, the sort of capstones and the milestones and the point of your work. So we're gonna take everything we heard today and package it together. We're gonna send out resources. We're gonna turn what we've heard over the last couple of days into an action agenda other thing we're going to do is we're going to send you an email with a survey and just to give you a little bit of incentive for those of you who are super interested in what um, Dr. Andre Perry said um, he wrote a book called Know Your Price that was referenced a couple of times um, I've been spending the time to go on my bookshelf so I'll do it again and we are actually going to have a number of you who fill out the survey will get a signed copy of Dr. Perry's book so please fill out the survey. Uh, we're gonna be sending you resources and we're gonna do everything we can um, to make sure that centering racial equity is an outcome of all of our work. As I've said many times, um, there's no such thing as equitable smart growth. If it's not equitable, it's not smart growth. And so remember everybody, as you go back to your work days, now is the time. Now is the time, now is the time. Thank you.